guys. We're going to be looking at the circulatory system today, so as we go through the lecture slides, make sure you take notes and be prepared to discuss and ask questions in class. The molecular trade that an animal carries out with its external environment, the gaining of oxygen and nutrients through the respiratory system and the digestive system, and the release of carbon dioxide and waste materials, again through the digestive system or through the excretory system, uh, ultimately involves every cell in the body. So when we look at the circulatory system, it's difficult to take it in isolation because it's so closely related to other systems in the body. But the circulatory system ultimately has its purpose in the exchange of materials. Animal cells exchange materials across their cell membranes uh, so that they can obtain fuel for energy, uh, nutrients, oxygen, waste, and release their waste products, that's urea and carbon dioxide. And if you are a small organism, a single-celled organism, that's going to be a relatively easy process because small molecules like oxygen and carbon dioxide can readily move between cells in their immediate surroundings by the process of diffusion. So that movement, if you recall from first semester, is dependent on a concentration gradient. And that is actually a relatively slow process if you're trying to move materials more than a distance of a few millimeters. So if you are an organism that's composed of many cells, that becomes actually a bit more challenging. Movement by diffusion is proportional to the square of the distance traveled. So you're using an exponent there to the second power. So for example, if a quantity of glucose takes one second to diffuse 100 micrometers, then it'll take 100 seconds to diffuse one millimeter. And that equates to approximately three hours to diffuse just one centimeter. So this places a constraint on the body plan of any animal. So natural selection has resulted in two basic adaptations that allow for effective exchange of materials through animal cells. The first is a body plan that puts cells in direct contact with the aqueous environment. So all the cells of the body are in direct contact with an aqueous environment, which allows for direct exchange of materials with the environment. An example of this type of body plan is an organism that has all of its tissues in a thin uh, stack with a gastrovascular center. And you see this in like tapeworms. They have a flat body, hollow center. The other adaptation that can exist is a body system that moves fluid through each cell and throughout the entire organism. And so we call that a circulatory system. So in the circulatory system, there's a variety of things that have to be transported, your nutrients and fuels from the digestive system, respiratory gases, that's the oxygen and carbon dioxide from the lungs and the gills. And you also need to be able to remove the waste products that are produced as a byproduct of metabolism. So these are going to be water, salts, nitrogenous wastes, um, carbon dioxide of course is, is a waste product, and then you're also moving protective agents, that's the immune defenses, your white blood cells and antibodies. Blood, blood clotting agents, the platelets that are found in your blood, are important to be able to circulate around in the event of injury. They move by positive feedback to the site of injury as well as your regulatory molecules, that is your hormones that are going to be released in response to specific stimuli. A circulatory system in animals has three basic components. A circulatory fluid, a set of interconnecting vessels, and a muscular pump. So mollusks, uh, such as clams and arthropods, such as insects and shellfish, have open circ circulatory systems. And in, an, in an open circulatory system, the fluid is called hemolymph, and it interacts directly with the interstitial fluid. So the heart pumps the hemolymph, which is going to bathe the organs directly. And so this fluid is not contained within um, the sort of vessels that we have in higher level circulatory systems. Instead, body movements and the heart relaxing are actually going to help to move the fluid back to the heart to be pumped again. In a closed circulatory system, blood is the circulatory fluid, and 
it's confined to vessels that are separate from the interstitial fluid. So chemical exchange occurs between the blood and the interstitial fluid, as well as between the interstitial fluid and the body cells. Closed circulatory systems are found in all vertebrate organisms, such as human, but it's also going to be found in some of our non-vertebrate organisms, including the annelids, which are earthworms, and most of our mollusks that have cephalization, meaning they have like a head-like region of the body, uh, such as a squid and an octopus, are also going to have a closed circulatory system. But the fact that we have both systems um, suggests that they've been selected for by natural selection. They must offer survival benefits. So an open circulatory system requires less energy due to its reliance on body movement to assist with circulation rather than uh, the pumping mechanisms. And in a closed system, the high blood pressure that's produced by the pumping of the fluid through the vessels allows for a more efficient, rapid exchange of materials. The circulatory system of all vertebrates contain at least one heart with two or more muscular chambers. The chambers that receive blood are called atria. The chambers that pump blood to the body are called ventricles. The number of heart chambers may vary, however. Fish have a simple cardiovascular system consisting of a two-chambered heart. Amphibians have a three-chambered heart and mammals have a four-chambered heart. In the single circulation arrangement of the two-chambered heart of a fish, blood enters and collects in the atrium before transfer to the ventricle where it's going to be pumped to the gills of the organism which serve as a site of gas exchange. And as the blood leaves the gills, it travels through capillaries, so it's going to experience a, a major drop in pressure as it makes its way through those capillaries. And these converge into a vessel that carries oxygen-rich blood to the body tissues, allowing for the delivery of oxygen to the tissues. The oxygen-depleted blood then returns to the heart. But this blood is traveling at such low pressures, uh, which really limits the amount of perfusion of blood to the body tissues, and as a result is going to have a limit on the metabolic activity of the fish. In double circulation, that's what happens in a three-chambered heart or a four-chambered heart, gas exchange is coordinated with nutrient and waste exchange. So you have these two circuits that are happening almost simultaneously. And the gas exchange we call the pulmonary circuit. In reptiles and mammals, it's going to involve lungs. In amphibians, it happens at the level of the skin, so we call it a pulmocutaneous circuit. The circuit for nutrient and waste exchange is called the systemic circuit. Blood traveling through the systemic circuit is under high pressure and produced by the pumping of the heart. That pressure is produced by the pumping of the heart, which allows for a higher rate of perfusion of body tissues, more efficient body metabolism. So you want to know the adaptive value of, of a four-chambered heart. That's because it serves as a double pump, and that's going to, going to allow for separation of the, the oxygen-rich blood and the oxygen-poor blood and allows you to maintain higher blood pressure. Amphibians are animals that spend time on both land and in water. And so when they're underwater, they may go really long periods of time without coming up for air at all. And so they rely on gas exchange through the skin during this time, completely bypassing the lungs. Because their ventricle is not divided, uh, completely the way it is in a four-chambered heart, the organism can actually shunt blood away from the lungs completely and just rely on gas exchange through the skin. But this is going to allow for lower levels of oxygen to be uh, perfused to the body. The differences in vertebrate heart structure reflect the close relationship between form and function that has arisen as a result of natural selection. Birds and mammals have a superior form of circulation indicative of their higher metabolic needs. Um, and so we're going to take a closer look at the mammalian heart. So an increase in body size offers protection from predation and also provides a larger stomach for consuming more nutrients. And if you're an endotherm, that means that you have the ability to colonize a wider range of habitats than ectotherms because you can better regulate your body temperature. And in birds, there's a strong selective pressure to be able to fly away from predators and to swoop in on prey. As endotherms, birds, and mammals use about 10 times the energy as their equal-sized ectotherms, they 
are therefore going to have certain they're going to need circulatory systems that deliver about 10 times as much nutrients and oxygen to their tissues. So when you have organisms that have evolved similar traits as a result of natural selection, despite being on seemingly discrete evolutionary paths, we call that convergent evolution, where their structures become more similar over time due to selective forces. The closed system of humans and other vertebrates is often called the cardiovascular system, describing the role of the chambered heart and the vessels in circulation. So you have the atria of the heart, which are responsible for receiving blood, the ventricles, which pump blood out away from the heart. The three types of blood vessels are the arteries, veins, and capillaries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart, so remember arteries away and they will diverge to form arterioles, which are smaller vessels. Veins return blood to the heart, and they will converge uh, from the bifurcation of the venules to form the larger vessels of the veins. And the capillaries are the thinnest structures in the circulatory system, the thinnest vessels. They have very thin walls that are specialized for exchange uh, or diffusion of materials. And so in a capillary bed, you're going to find a network of capillaries, which will be the site of this exchange. So let's take a closer look at these blood vessels. Our arteries um, bifurcate to form arterioles. The arterioles will then bifurcate or diverge even into more branches called capillaries. And the capillaries then will converge upon the venules. The venules will converge to, on to form the veins. So you can see there's some differences in the anatomical structure. And we're going to focus first on the arteries, which have thicker walls. These, the thickness of the wall provide for strength against the high pressure of the pumping of the blood. They also have a slightly more narrow diameter. And they have a feature of elasticity that allows for recoil to happen um, as the blood is flowing through the body and you have that strong force from the pumping of the heart so it can withstand that force and then also not remain in a stretched out uh, shape when blood is no longer in the artery and so it recoils when the heart relaxes. Veins seem to be built for a much lower pressure environment, and so they have a thinner wall. They don't have to withstand the same force of the heart pumping, and they have a wider diameter, which allows for collection of the blood in the veins and uh, for the blood to travel back through the heart at a much lower velocity and lower pressure. This lower pressure is at least partly, in due, to the, partly due to the fact that you're farther from the heart, farther from that pumping mechanism, and so blood has a challenge to make it back to the heart to be pumped again. So skeletal muscle movements, just as you sit, you fidget, as you get up and you move, uh, especially when you're exercising, that's going to help facilitate the movement of blood back towards the heart. So it's important to stay active. You find blood pools in your legs and collects when you sit still for long periods of time. When you're on a flight, they encourage you to get up and move around so that the blood doesn't pool long enough to actually form a clot, which could be potentially life-threatening. So the movement is going to help squeeze that blood through your veins. And another important feature of the veins is the presence of valves. And so valves allow for one-way one movement of blood through the heart um, and prevent the backflow of blood so that it, it doesn't have any choice in where it goes. It's on a one-way street.